Imagine diving underwater 100 meters, wearing just a wetsuit and fins, and with one breath. That's the height of Big Ben, or the 25th floor of a building. If that doesn't scare you, then you're a world-class freediver, or you've got a screw loose. Fight or flight plays out in subtle ways that sabotage us whenever we face a challenge. It evolved as a survival reaction, but in modern life it's more likely to be triggered by an imagined threat, such as embarrassment or failing at something. Hi, I'm Tom. Let's take a look inside the world of freediving and explore how to face our fear. We'll look under the surface of our awareness at the subconscious struggle between mind and body, and we'll look at the role of emotions in learning using new discoveries from neuroscience and psychology. My brother is British champion freediver and world number five Mike Board. I've been following his career with fascination for years and so I'm really excited to finally learn to freedive. Gili Truangan is a tiny island near Bali in Indonesia. When I arrived, Mike and his team were all tired in the aftermath of the recent earthquake and aftershocks. They helped evacuate the injured on Mike's dive boat and worked with everyone who stayed to clear rubble and make the island safe again. That was a few weeks ago and already the tourist boats are starting to return as life ebbs back to normal. Right, so you're, you're a 111 meter diver now. Congratulations, by the way, on your new uh, national record. You told me that you started free dive Gilly when you were uh, like a humble 40, 40 meter something diver, right? That's right, yeah. Did you always have your sights set on, on real depth or is that something that just developed organically over time? It's just something that's developed over time. My first motives were pretty much business motives. I remember thinking, all right, how do I set myself apart from other freediving schools in the area? And I thought, okay, a national record would be good. So uh, what, let's look at the national records, what's possible? And I could, I could see that the free immersion one was 67 meters. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna train for that. Yeah, I went to e I went to Egypt, and, and this is when I met Sarah Campbell, and she was like my first sort of mentor within the sport, and I learned so much from her at the time. And she basically coached me uh, up to 68 meters in that first national record. That's when I began to sort of really get a taste for the deep free diving and exploring what was actually possible, and start setting my sights further. As I relax into the giddy rhythm of life, I take a scuba diving trip to get comfortable in the water again. And my thoughts start turning towards the free diving ahead of me. So at dinner last night, Mike was asking me, um, what was I feeling about the free diving, which starts tomorrow. Um, I've been thinking about the level of exertion and how it feels to exert yourself when you're not breathing. Because I'm used to when I'm um, pushing myself, uh, for example, in my martial arts, I'm used to using breathing as a, as a means to find the energy um, and to sustain my effort over time. And I guess I'm a little bit worried about the discomfort, anticipating it might be quite, quite painful. <laughs> so, um, so, so what Mike said to me about the exerting effort thing is that's kind of the wrong, exerting is the wrong word. He was saying that the feeling of uh, free diving um, when you're in the right state, both mentally and physically, should be one of relaxed effort. So like just walking along the road. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to be feeling calm. I don't think I'm going to be bragging to you later on my depth achievements, put it that way.
first start diving, as you progress, when you, when you put your body into a, a threatening environment, which at the end of the day, uh, holding your breath and diving as deep as you can yeah. out of the water, is a threatening environment. Yeah. Yeah. So, so your body has a fight and flight reaction, which you can't control. And beginner freedivers see this all the time. Yeah, there's millions you, of you, years you, of evolution. Uh, yeah, and you're trying to fight something. Yeah, and, and as smart and as rational and as good at uh, intellectualizing as you are, you can't change your body's reactions to being under threat. And I saw this 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 week teaching my brother. And, uh, and at the end of the day, as much as he understands what's going on, you cannot change how your body reacts when you put it into a dangerous situation. A healthy person's body is fully oxygenated at rest, so to my surprise there are no special breathing practices before a dive. The method we do learn is called recovery breathing, which is obviously to help recovery after a dive. So the level one theory is about calming your mind and learning about the body's respiratory system. But simply, whilst diving you are consuming the oxygen in your blood and creating CO2 as a byproduct. And as you go deeper, your lungs compress creating imbalances between the water pressure and air pressure in your airways. So you have to learn equalisation techniques to counter this. Holding your breath for long periods causes convulsions of the diaphragm as the body automatically tries to expel the increasing levels of CO2 building up in your lungs. So you can safely dive for two and a half minutes before CO2 levels might cause problems, which is plenty of time to dive to 20 metres. But try telling your brain that. So the physical triggers of fear tend to be equalisation difficulties and the discomfort caused by convulsions of the diaphragm as your body tries to expel that CO2. The simple if not easy solution to both is just to relax and go with the flow. Holding on to the right mental state, however, is a constant struggle. Imordino Yang's book, Emotions, Learning and the Brain, sheds light on the interplay between rational thoughts and emotion. Human beings have basic emotions such as fear and disgust to keep us off the edges of cliffs and to make us avoid spoiled food. We have social emotions, such as love, to make us affiliate, procreate and care for our children. Thanks to our intelligent plastic brain, we can also develop emotions that colour and steer our intellectual and social endeavours. These complex intellectual and social emotions are the subjective behavioural and mental reactions we have to situations and concepts of all sorts. Reactions that play out in the body, for example through a racing heart, and in the mind through characteristic ways of thinking. The afternoon pool training provides a structured introduction to these new sensations and skills. The standard required of a level one freediver is to swim underwater 25 metres, which sounds more difficult than it is. We all succeed, as well as completing our rescue dive drills. The confidence I've gained from this limited experience has already convinced me that I'm not going to be battling for my life tomorrow trying to dive to 10 or 20 metres. I just have to stay calm, equalise, and cope with the convulsions as they come. So why then do I feel so anxious? Oh
I was really blown away at just how amazing a good dive can feel. The wonderful sensations of relaxation and flow and the joyful sense of belonging were more akin to a spiritual experience. But right now I'm struggling on every dive to find those feelings again. So let's dive a bit deeper into what's going on. Talking with Mike about it, I realized my habitual reaction to stress is to push even harder. Yeah, I'm going down and I just, I turn. Yeah. In my head, I'm like, I'm, I'm pushing myself to go further, but something made me At turn. At that moment, yeah. during a dive, you are unable to continue. Yeah. And even though you get back up to the surface and actually you feel quite fine, yeah. um, and if you're asked, why did you turn? It's like, your only response is, I, I, I wanted to turn. <laughs> so I'm trying to force myself to relax which when you think about it is kind of ridiculous. You look down to see how far you've got to go. If you, and so it takes you totally out of being um, conscious of what's actually happening. If you're actually, uh, you're able to hold your breath and your equalization is going well, then you're okay to continue. Until yeah. yeah. you actually reach a, like, an, a, an so. actual limit. So you're, you're actually reading what's happening in your body and letting that determine how far you go rather than um, you letting your mind determine how far you'll go. Because the true nature of a free dive is actually um, more akin to meditation. Um, the way we learn free diving is by attaching uh, positive experiences to it. In other words, thinking of the future takes your feelings out of the present moment, potentially letting fear in despite everything being absolutely fine. I guess what I've learned about myself is that that I hide a lot of my feelings and fears. But then you make those discoveries, those moments when something goes right and it, and it just feels great. Uh, I, I only had one dive <laughs> where I felt amazing. Um, just this sense of, of float floating, effortless, joyful, happy sort of feeling. It's uh, a lovely sensation. And, um, and, and I now see why people free dive. I mean, that's, uh, that, that sensation is why people do it. Relaxing in the face of fear seems a paradoxical idea because we confuse two things, the feeling of the fear and the reality of the situation. A common belief is that fear is in the mind, but as neuroscientist Dr. Joe Dispenza puts it, the subconscious mind lives in the body, and as we've seen, fear is a feeling before it is a thought. Whilst the advice to feel the fear and do it anyway is true, experience tells us that knowing this is not enough. So how do you train your emotions? The neuroscientific understanding of learning is the construction of distributed neural networks that support skills. 
This sort of learning has to go deeper than the sort of cramming for exams we learn to do as students. That learning doesn't stick, let alone translate practically. Using the Iowa gambling task, Imodino Yang studies the role of emotion and skilled intuition in learning. Participants are taught the rules of the game in which they are presented with four decks of cards. Two of the decks are rigged. They usually deliver higher rewards but occasionally dish out big losses. As people pick cards from the decks, the first signs of learning are their physiological reactions like raised heart rate and perspiration. As they take cards from the rigged decks, they experience excitement and attraction. Until, that is, they have a big loss. After this point, reaching for one of the rigged decks triggers the anticipatory response of anxiety. This emotional information steers them towards other decks before they are even consciously aware. Only after many repetitions of the game do they start to develop cognitive insights. Armed with their emotional memories from feeling their way through earlier rounds of play, they begin to consciously think about their strategy for playing the game. In other words, we use an emotional guidance system for learning that hardwires our neural networks with knowledge that is connected with emotional maps of that knowledge in use. Thereafter, we navigate with these maps unconsciously. A co-authored paper by Imodino Yang that is called Rest is Not Idleness sheds light on a key skill for emotional learning, consciously managing your attention. She describes two types of attention that she calls looking out and looking in. We have to toggle between these modes since we cannot use them both at the same time. These attention modes are the product of two different neural networks that monitor and respond to the world around us and focus our mental processing. Looking in is our resting state when we're able to relax, reflect and daydream. This state focuses our attention on the inner psychological self. Our thoughts are in free flow, able to free wheel with associations. We can contemplate and evaluate and simulate feelings and experiences. We can think longer term about ourselves, other people and the future. Think of it as downtime mode. You feel relaxed, open and reflective. Looking out mode is our doing mode. Attention turns to the external world and becomes short-term focused and goal-directed. Our attention is focused on the environment, scanning for the concrete, the physical, on knowing the facts and being aware of our immediate situation. The looking out mode comes at the expense of learning, which is facilitated by looking in. Just as Mike urged us to stay with our bodily feelings to avoid our thoughts wandering off towards future goals, Participants in these studies reported feelings felt in the body when they were looking in. The ability to look in can be trained. Mike does it through meditation and mindful practice, giving him fast access to the stillness of mind and relaxation that looking in requires. And Imordino Yang's research also suggests that meditation is an excellent way to train your brain's neural networks for introspection. Reflecting, dreaming and learning don't happen when we're tense and stressed so we are less likely to have those positive experiences. Where we used to sit Why did I think you would tell the truth So if there's one thought I'd like to leave you with, it's this. The next time things get hard and the fight or flight response surfaces, beware of the instinct to push. When you're pushing towards a goal, you're in looking out mode. This doesn't give you access to the neural networks you need for deep learning. So when a goal scares you, don't push, relax. We'll be going deeper into learning goals in a future video.